Ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm uh, delighted to introduce uh, the, uh, Carlos Amodas, who's the mayor of Lisbon in Portugal. Um, and Carlos, uh, if I just if I were just want to read a little bit of an introduction here, um, is an engineer, technology engineer by training and obtained an MBA from Harvard Business School. Um, he uh, became the fifth Portuguese national to be appointed as European commissioner uh, in, uh, since Portugal joined the EU. He ran a $77 billion science and innovation program across the European Union. He was previously the Secretary of State to the Prime Minister of Portugal and an elected member of the Portuguese Parliament. In 2020, he joined the Calust uh, uh, Golubkian Foundation as a trustee. And in March 2021, he's decided to run for Mayor of Lisbon. And on the 26th of September 2021, he was elected Mayor of Lisbon. And we uh, asked, we, we are delighted to welcome him today uh, as part of Tech Fuji's Live uh, to address uh, our meeting and talk about um, uh, talk about uh, what Portugal is doing and what Lisbon is doing. Thank you very much for coming, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me today. Uh, it's really uh, special for me to be with all of you. Um, being myself an engineer, I was um, actually working, as you know, as a commissioner for innovation in science for five years. And in 2015, I actually um, signed the first agreement of science in between the Ukraine and the European Union, uh, which allowed the Ukrainian scientists to participate in all the European programs. And so here I am now in a totally different uh, job, which is being mayor of a great city, the city of Lisbon, uh, and a city that I want to be the capital of innovation. And as the capital of innovation that I want to create in this city, I really want to have diversity. I want uh, Lisbon to be open to everyone and all the Ukrainian Ukrainians that can come to Lisbon, they should come. We have prepared the city for them. Uh, we have a center that um, today we have received more than 3000 contacts. We have ways of uh, getting people from the border to Lisbon and other cities in Portugal. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of an idea, we had more than 2,500 Portuguese people trying to help. So we have uh, job offers, we have uh, places for people to stay. Uh, and, and so we are very excited to get uh, the Ukrainian community that is very linked to our town because uh, for the last 10, 15 years, a lot of Ukrainian families and the Ukrainian community has been really settled uh, in the Portuguese environment and especially in Lisbon, just uh, to have the number in Portugal, we have more than 28,000 uh, Ukrainians. And so I think this is an opportunity um, to help everyone. And, uh, you know, um, uh, this has been two very difficult weeks for my team because we have been dealing case by case uh, receiving the families, trying to uh, help the families. And so um, I just can tell you how uh, really tough for everyone it has been, but at the same time, we feel that we are doing our job to help everyone. Uh, second uh, point that I want just to uh, bring to you uh, is basically to tell, talk about first the job that we want to do in terms of innovation in Lisbon and uh, to um, thank you for the opportunities because we want to have more tech in the city and so as you know Lisbon is known for the web summit so every year there's this big web summit on November but we have now created what we call a unicorn factory which I'm launching to have a different way of looking at innovation on a kind of a factory, let's call it a factory where startups come in, you have a big companies, big tech companies that can help these tech people to develop in terms of marketing, in terms of processes, in terms of access to venture capital. And we are building that in Lisbon as we speak. We have the local, we have the premises, and we're doing it. And my idea is to bring a lot of the tech people that are now in Ukraine, the ones that are leaving Ukraine, to tell them that you have a safe harbor here in Lisbon for tech. And so 
today we are putting all these companies together, Portuguese companies and other companies. So I just inaugurated um, the new building for uh, one of the Swedish companies that have settled here in Lisbon, more than 40 people, and they want to hire up to 150 called Evolution Game. And uh, I can give you another example, but this one was just this week. Uh, and so I think that we have everything today uh, to make it possible, to make possible that we have people coming uh, with that tech background to Lisbon and uh, finding the solutions that are essential for our country because we need more people in tech. Uh, and uh, the fact of the matter is that if we can really have people from a country that is, I would call it a brother country from the perspective of the Portuguese people, as we have been um, for so long uh, working with Ukrainian people here in Portugal. They are one of the biggest communities that we have, by the way, in Lisbon. So I think that uh, for me, that will be really an honor and a pleasure. So um, I uh, will give you, um, and I can write you down here, the email and the phone number that you can call in Lisbon, so we can really uh, make it happen. Then uh, I also have on the cultural side, everything related to culture uh, and technology, but also on the cultural side of the city, uh, we are setting up also points of contact for um, people that come from the world of arts, theater, cinema, uh, in performing arts, which uh, we are actually very, very, very keen on also inviting to come uh, to our country, but in this case to my city, which is Lisbon. So this was a little bit of the message uh, in a nutshell that I wanted to um, really uh, to send to everybody in these so very difficult times and um, uh, with so uh, much emotion for those that are on the ground uh, receiving uh, all these um, uh, Ukrainian families uh, that I thought that coming here and giving a little bit of a message of hope that Lisbon is a safe harbor for those that are tech lovers, for those that really believe that we can create a city of innovation, uh, as I think uh, we can uh, in all um, areas of technology. Uh, I think that Lisbon is open to that. So thank you. Um, look, I don't have more to offer, but um, thank you. Uh, I have this to offer. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Perhaps if you if I could just ask a quick question before we we, we go, we go. Um, you have uh, obviously been very welcoming to Ukrainian refugees and displaced people. Uh, what's uh, give us an idea of the scale of the numbers? How many people have come to Portugal in the last um, couple of weeks? I think I would estimate, so uh, in Lisbon, we have in the first week, we helped uh, around 300 people that a lot of them were already in Lisbon. So they were on vacation in Lisbon. Uh, then we, ha we have um, basically received two or three airplanes with another 300 people each. So I think that uh, at the moment, we probably are at 1,000 and something. Uh, but we have a lot of capacity because we have a community of 28,000, but in the past, Lisbon and Portugal all over used to have around 100,000 Ukrainians. So, uh, you know, those families right. can come. A lot of them are arriving by car, so we, we are not counting those. And yeah. so I would estimate at around 2,000 for uh, the moment, uh, which, uh, to be frank, is very little compared to the efforts of the countries that are closer geographically to Ukraine. So I think that this has to be a, a support of all the countries in the European Union. Uh, and uh, Portugal is open to that. And, and so uh, please um, uh, come to, to our country with no thank problem you. at all. What do you think about what the European Union is doing and how it's reacting to the situation at the moment? Do you, are you satisfied with what the EU is doing? Look, it's always uh, very difficult uh, when you have a union of 27 countries uh, to be fully satisfied. But I can tell you by experience, it's the first time that I see the union so united. And this is very different from uh, the, the times that I was at the European Commission. Uh, the union of people, and uh, especially the way that people are welcoming uh, everyone from Ukraine, it's a very unique moment in time. But more than that, 
is actually a very important moment in time to understand how the European Union is important for peace. I mean, European Union was the project of peace until uh, the 1950s, Europe was about war. The 100 year war, the 30 year war, the nine year war, every time there was war. And the European Union was that ability to uh, become a peaceful platform. And uh, for the last couple, I think um, uh, two decades, we forgot that. And now we are reminded that uh, we are uh, being somehow in a war in Europe, which is something that is unbelievable that this can happen, but also gives us an opportunity to rethink the role, the important role of Europe. But you know, we can always find fail, failure and things that I, sh I think could be done differently. But for the moment, I think that the European Union is reacting very well. And I think that people are united around uh, this fight and to uh, be really uh, without any hesitation on the side of Ukraine. Um, and that is very good to see. Fantastic. Well, Carlos Murdas, thank you very much. The Mayor of Lisbon, really appreciate you coming today to Tech Fugees Live. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Looking forward to see you soon. Thank okay. you. We're now going to continue with our, our pitches. Um, and the next up is uh, activechat.ai. So, Andrew, if you would like to go ahead, you can have three minutes. Thank you. Cool, cool, awesome. So, uh, great opportunity to speak right after the mayor of Lisbon. Great city, great country, and uh, I appreciate uh, the efforts of TechFugees.com uh, actually for organizing this in such a short time. Amazing, um, great job, guys. So, I'm Andrew from uh, Active Chat, and uh, we are a contact center automation tool that solves the issue of dump chatbots and virtual assistants. I know most of you know this issue. The problem is actually uh, not about the technology itself. The tech is pretty awesome. The issue is how companies handle their data and how this data is used for customer service automation. Even today, it still takes weeks and months of development to build a decent chatbot uh, which understands natural language. And the cost of this conversational automation grows exponentially with the number of scenarios that a virtual assistant has to address. We at Active Chat take it to the next level. With our technology, any company is able to use their existing data in almost any form, be it uh, conversation logs, company knowledge base, or even plain website data, to build a machine learning model that is able to accurately answer questions on specific knowledge domain in just minutes. And once this initial training is complete, this model can be retrained and improved manually through actual interactions happening either automatically with a chatbot or through human live chat agents. And then more complex scenarios with deep business integrations can be built in just hours instead of weeks and months of development. One of our customers, uh, a low company countrywide group from the United Kingdom, they have over 1,000 of different scenarios uh, in their virtual assistant to automate requests coming from their customers. And deploying that model took just a couple of weeks for them. Another customer, Connected Health, a healthcare provider from Singapore, were able to automate over 70% of conversations in their mobile app in just a month. And they love the performance of the tool. And right now we are working with Morgan & Morgan, a huge low company from United States uh, to evaluate our technology for their outbound SMS marketing automation to understand what the customers are responding with. And we expect to close this deal pretty soon. And another recent example, um, building an advanced volunteer assistance system in seven different languages to help coordinate current international delivery and distribution of humanitarian aid in Ukraine. Took us just three days to deploy. We are still working on this, and you can see the link uh, in the slide deck. Currently, we are a part of Concordia Design Accelerator in Poland, <coughs> sorry, and the Rising Up in Spain program by the Spanish government. And we are planning a seed round with Shape VC and Smoke VC. These are two VC funds from Poland early this spring. We are hungry for more case studies with large enterprises in telecom, in law, in utilities, and in finance sectors to help these companies build better customer experiences uh, with conversational AI. If you know someone who can potentially benefit from automating their customer care, I will be happy to provide more information in personal communication. Again, thank you for the opportunity to present, uh, to talk. If you have any questions, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We've got a quick question. Go um, okay. Are you like? Are you planning to charge for the help to NGOs? Who might be mm -hmm.
no, uh, no, uh, no, no. Uh, what we are doing with this alternative way help uh, project is uh, completely free of charge, and I can put you in contact with the organizers. It is an official program uh, with uh, Lviv administration, with Ukrainian government. I can definitely put you in contact, and they are doing a pretty um, decent job uh, there. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, we're definitely. That's the whole point of today. Is to, is a, as a kind of a matching up matchmaking process to uh, bring people together for, the, for their applications and their, their uh, platforms and, and services. So thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate your, your time today. Next up is um, this one. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, Catherine, Katerina? Yeah, Katerina. Yeah, hi. Thanks so much for a I really appreciate you coming today. Uh, we will uh, block out Belarus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that. And uh, we will have the Slavia Yay! And uh, so you go ahead and tell us all about Frontline Live. Thank you very much for coming. No, thanks for um, organizing everything and having us here. It's great. Uh, yeah, my name is Katarina. I'm a founding member and core team member of Frontline Live. I wanted to share a video on how the platform works just to bring it to life, but I think it's not possible. So I, I will explain it. Uh, we came into existence during the PPE crisis uh, in the UK in 2020, uh, where there was, as some of you know, lots of healthcare professionals uh, needing PPE for their safety and didn't have them. So we brought this platform into life where healthcare professionals were able to uh, tweet uh, needs that they had in terms of PPE and then anyone who could supply these needs were able to immediately respond and get the um, PPE that was needed across the whole of the UK. Um, we learned a lot from this journey. We were in field for over um, a year. We delivered more than half a million pieces of PPE uh, to healthcare professionals at the time, saved lots of lives. Um, and now we want to use this platform for any other crises. And obviously uh, the Ukraine war um, happened and we saw the opportunity of actually now using this open source platform uh, for the Ukraine crisis to coordinate uh, supply and demand uh, in real time. Um, during the PPE crisis, we saw a lot of um, people using, coming up with um, pop-up pla matching platforms and um, individuals uh, filling out forms like we have this, I have this, et cetera. Um, but it's, it's great, but it's not dynamic and it's not scalable, this approach. And, and hence this platform really allows a coordinated supply and demand matching um, in real time. So our system is distributed. We have people and organizations on the front line updating their own requests uh, and amend when those needs change. Uh, we put the data on the map um, so people who have supplies can get them there where they're needed really quickly. Um, our volunteers are there to check um, whoever is supplying um, stuff and also um, the quality of the supplies. Um, and then once um, it's on the map, it's really over to them and, and deliver it. Um, we had lots of learnings from this initial crisis. We have mapped out an operating model so how we work globally as a distributed network of volunteers to avoid risk and making sure we work as efficiently as possible. The operating model is on GitHub. So we hope that whoever else spins up a new version um, of this and answer to their own needs will improve it uh, because we don't want to start from scratch. Uh, we spent the last two weeks planning for Frontline Life Ukraine uh, with multiple partners, the, like the government there, the Pole International, the Port Authority of Ukraine, the Diaspora Initiative, small army of our uh, Ukrainian volunteers. We also, also have registered hospitals and medical centers that can report medical supplies that if they are running short of that. And I'm keen to connect with some of you who chatted already who do the transportation into the Ukraine. We have community centers that can report what domestic supplies are needed and where and when. Um, so anyone who is interested, it's open source, it can be just used. All the details are in the operating um, model and handbook, and, and it's, it, it's there and ready for anyone who wants to pick this up. And hopefully Frontline Life Ukraine is up and running by the end of next week. Uh, so then we have coordinated supply and demand matching. Fantastic. Thank you very much. 
Katrina. Uh, Katrina, um, uh, have you got any partners involved uh, yet, or are you looking for partners? Uh, we are very open for partners. I think it's really crucial, um, especially in the coordination of these supply and demands. And there are obviously lots of um, people who, who bring supplies to the borders, for example, as well. So as I said, we are at the moment cooperating with the Ukrainian government and the Pole International. Um, but I'm really, uh, we're, we're, we're really keen and open to cooperate with anyone. Fantastic. Well, how amazing that you uh managed to create uh, such a platform for the pandemic and now can be used in this manner. Really yes. Thank you so much. For Thank you. Citizens of Our Planet, and I'm delighted to be joined now uh, by Alina from Citizens of Our Planet, uh, a Chili Piper Foundation. Chili Piper is a fantastic partner with tech refugees. And uh, Alina van der Berg is a serial entrepreneur uh, uh, and co-founder of Chili Piper. And so we're now going to hear from her about how, how's, how are things going? Alina, how are you? I'm uh, calling today from uh, New York. Um, I have, I'm holding the fort for everybody uh, that uh, worries about Ukraine here in the US and making sure that everybody is constantly aware of the tra tragic, uh, tragic events there. Uh, at Chili Piper, we're a tech company and we're actually a unicorn here. And uh, we have employees in Ukraine, in Russia, in Belarus, in Belarus as well, and they're also in a in a very difficult situation um, because most people there don't uh, agree with the war and they want to help us, um, at least the ones that we're in touch with. We started a foundation um, and we partnered with uh, TechFugees about a year ago, and the things that we care about are very aligned with that of TechFugees in that we want to stop violence, um, not only uh, uh, the kind of violence that Ukraine is going through right now, but uh, we also aim to have a peaceful um, team as well internally and, and microaggression. So the alignment is, is there. Personally, I have a lot of friends in Ukraine, so I'm very motivated to help in the Ukrainian crisis. Immediately before the war started, we started putting together a relocation Google Doc for our own employees and for my friends. and. That Google document became an entire uh, living uh, document. I can put a link after the presentation where you can find it with resources on how to relocate in Portugal, in Romania, in, in Hungary, in, and many other places as uh, they have these difficult journeys, and especially mothers and children. And I'm a mother myself, and it, it's something very uh, emotional for me. Um, um, Alina, we're, um, we, we are short on time because we've got, we, we need to we have our final presentations, but there's two things I wanted to uh, draw out from you. First of all, was the amazing relocation document which you put together at Chili Piper with destinations across the world. Tell us a little briefly about that, first of all, and then secondly, after that, tell us a little bit about the platform that you've created using our Airtable. So, but first of all, let's hear about the relocation doc so the relocation doc uh, has been accessed by fourteen thousand people so far and typically what happens is that somebody who's on linkedin because that's how i share the document um, has contact with ukrainian families and they disseminate the information in telegram channels and whatsapp channels based on where they're uh, going and making sure that they're going they're going to have shelter that they're going to go through borders safely uh, through the waiting lines that are the shortest and also that once they arrive in their destinations, they're uh, put in touch with uh, the right resources so that they can have a job as well. And that's uh, by country by country, because I wouldn't expect that uh, people that uh, are low tech um, generally will ac access a Google Doc, but normally one person that is in my network out of the 15,000 people, they disseminate that information to several families all at once and they help several families all at once to getting to the final destination safely. Um, so that's that's a bit on the Google Doc front. On the platform, um, so when the whole uh, situation started, we put some money to work because we knew that UN and Red Cross will not immediately reach to the smaller NGOs at the border to mobilize themselves properly. And we started putting some cash into um, directly in, on the Polish NGOs, the Romanian NGOs. Uh, and we noticed that these smaller NGOs do not have the capacity to do to respond to all the needs that are coming through, uh, not only after somebody crosses a border, but even within the needs of Ukraine. 
Um, so we saw immediately the, the chaos, chaos around the supplies and demand similar to how Frontline did. So we put something immediately together in a day, an air table, and we started uh, uh, matching as much as we could. And right now the, the biggest need that we see is that there should be some transparencies, especially on the uh, Romanian side and uh, you, you Hungarian side, because they're less overwhelmed as Poland would be in order to actually deliver on the supplies requests that are coming through Ukraine. And uh, ideally, we would expose those needs to larger NGOs in other countries like Germany and UK and US. So we started the, going live on our website and um, uh, having similar conversation to uh, that of frontline with the UN, with uh, the Ukrainian government as well. So hopefully it will all be a consolidated effort. Right. Um, I, it sounds like you might have uh, an urgent matters to attend to in the background, but um, I, I wanted to quickly ask you, finally, um, what, um, what are your um, aspirations for the, either the platform or the other kinds of activities you're involved with next? Uh, what's your, what are your next aims with your, your own strategy? Yeah, uh, I was on mute, probably the baby um, was uh, not cooperating with uh, my mom. Um, so the on the immediate need until uh, somebody can own this platform and somebody more equipped with all the right uh, resources such as Frontline, uh, we see immediate need to uh, match some of the, the shipments that are happening right now for baby clothes and uh, formulas and medicine. Um, match the smaller NGOs with larger NGOs in UK and US um, with cash specifically to make sure that these deliveries uh, go safely because there is communication with internal uh, crossing of border in Ukraine. There is uh, There are supplies, especially on the Romanian side, to be delivered within Ukraine, but there's no cash for the smaller NGOs to actually make these things happen. Um, so I see an urgent need of cash. Um, so if anybody's willing to help these NGOs, we can map match them immediately and show you what they're delivering and to whom um, to make sure that these things go uh, through the border safely now, because the time is not on our side. Well, thank you very much, Lena, for that brief uh, appraisal of uh, what's going on. And thank you very much to Citizens of Our Planet. For its, uh, thank you, Mike, for putting this together. It's great. Uh, right. Well, this is in person, so we're very honoured. Thank you. Over to you. Fantastic. Okay, great. Uh -huh. So, hi, everyone. My name is Olga Kravchenko, and I'm representing today in Sunflower Relief as one of their volunteers. Sunflower Relief is a UK-based charity that has been founded by a Ukrainian-born uh, Ira Ariela King, who is based in London. Sunflower aims to connect the immediate needs of Ukrainian locals with immediate local solutions, emergency supply services, support, and capture first-hand accounts of the evolving situation on the ground to share with the wider world. Our mission is simple. We want to get aid into the depths of the country and get the reliable eyewitness info out so, to the world. Speak up a little bit. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. We believe that the best support for Ukraine is admirable, but at the top level, this is predominantly focused on equipping the military, while organizations' humanitarian efforts have been hampered by a lack of understanding. Oh, really? Thank you, I'm so quiet. <clears throat> while the humanitarian efforts have been hampered by a lack of understanding about genuine needs on the ground. So what we've done, we've divided the supply, logistic, demand, and receivers to make sure they're being matched immediately. And we can respond as an organization to the immediate needs on the ground. We exist to better align these aid efforts with citizens' most urgent priorities. So if you have funding, and or supplies that you want to deploy to a trusted, verified NGOs on the Ukrainian ground, Sunflower is here to support it. With the help of interpreters and end-to-end -end logistic providers, we ensure that all donations get to people that need it most and that need it right now. So please connect to Ira, Ira's email is there, or speak to me if you're in the room. And um, thank you so much and Slava Ukraine. Yeah. So, how would you compare yourselves to other NGOs on the ground? What are you doing? The same, the same or different? 
So what we're trying to do, we are trying to we are trying to be the connecting mechanism between hundreds of NGOs that are already in Ukraine. And because we speak English, Ukrainian, Polish, Russian, we can actually directly approach them. We're already growing a huge database that we are verifying and making sure that when we have the support, we can get it to the person and to the end receiver, because that's something what most of the platforms are missing. Who is this aid going to? Is it a hospital? Is it an orphanage? Or is it a volunteering group who will give it out for free on the ground? Fantastic. That's amazing. And it's particularly this, uh, this, the fact that you've got this broad spread of languages that's super helpful, one thing. Brilliant. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Hi, you know, um, I just uh, get crushed this, you know, as of yesterday, I didn't have a clue how I was going to be used you know, to the Ukrainian refugees, but I started Step Up three years ago uh, to reskill and employ refugees who've been forgotten in refugee camps run by UNHCR. Like these guys have never seen a school. Right? Uh, we, we started three years ago uh, with five refugees in a camp called Kakuma in Kenya. Uh, we reskilled them into digital professionals with an ability to deliver digital selling digital marketing, uh, recruiting and fundraising and so on and so forth. Um, and we started working for global clients, uh, including startups, scale-ups and large enterprises. But uh, how are we going to be useful to this current Ukrainian crisis? It just happened yesterday. One of our uh, Ukrainian clients, uh, he has a, a children's storybook uh, store in New York City. Uh, and he has translated more than 100 children's books into the Ukraine language. Now, he wants those children's story books to reach all the refugees and the moms and uh, daughters, you know, who are in this, uh, you know, movement. So he asked me if I could help him find a way to take all of those digital stuff that he has done, those hundreds of books, and then be able to give it to those children who are on the move. So we really... Um, we were searching for a solution and we, we jointly found a solution of going to all the Facebook groups, LinkedIn groups, Instagram. Uh, we started collecting every single group that's out there. We, at this moment of time, we have collected more than 130 groups uh, with more than uh, you know, 2 million people inside those groups. And these groups have been created in the last uh, couple of weeks. You know, these groups uh, did not exist you know, uh, for a long time. So what uh, suddenly when Hussein contacted me, I really thought, okay, if, if we could do this for children's books, we could do it for you know, anyone else, right? And, and you, why can't you do this? You know, if I gave you this list, you, know, you should do it yourself. But the problem is you know, of time. I have today in step up.1 more than 1400 refugees across seven refugee camps who is very, very well-versed in taking a digital problem, converting it to a content, and then amplifying it across all these 1,000 plus groups. If we simply put a small post into my group, it will immediately get translated into those 1,000 plus groups within, the, within like 24 hours. You can't do this, right? I mean, just to identify those 1,000 groups where the Ukrainians are there today, it will take you a long time and then join them, and then try to post it to them. It's a very, very big. So what I'm here to offer today is the same refugees who's been helping global clients are more than willing to help the Ukrainian refugees today. If, if anybody has anything digital, of course, you know, we can't take anything physical, right? But if you have anything digital, and if you want to reach these, you know, 4 million refugees in, in, in the click of a button, we could do that for you. Yeah. Okay, your time is up. Thanks, sir. Yeah. Okay, we have a question. Last, uh, last on Zoom today. Uh, before we do, well, before we do a quick check in the country group, see if we can find some. Is Paula? Where is she going? I'm here. Hello. Thanks very much for coming. Oh, you're in a car. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Tech for Ukraine started as a number of working groups around emergency aid and medical aid um, and a coordination of individuals that were also very closely linked, thank you, Mike, to Tech Fugees. Um, and it began as tech channels where people were coordinating support. So you can um, visit our website, techforukraine.info, in order to join one of the working groups. Right now, I actually stepped out of a meeting 
collaborating with a group here in Athens, I live in Greece, um, that is working on NFTs for Syrian refugees, and they are leaving this group tomorrow to Poland to also explore what is happening on the border um, of Poland and Ukraine. So um, if you know anyone who is working on NFTs regarding the crisis, meaning um, galleries, meaning um, sort of grassroots artists, and we would be happy to actually put them on um, our platform, um, either on OpenSea or on other providers, because we do have a large network of donors who are looking to purchase NFTs from um, refugees uh, who are affected by the current crisis in the Ukraine. And um, as a background of a tech for Ukraine, we are a network um, of entrepreneurs, of um, humanitarian workers, and of people who were impacted by the Syrian refugee crisis very heavily. Personally, I'm half Greek and half German. I consider myself part of the network. Um, and it's a decentralized autonomous organization of people who come together and say, hey, we actually need to do something in order to improve the situation. So um, TechFugees is working with the topic of refugees. We are working more on um, also the second um, aspect of upbuilding, which is um, investments in the long run into the region of Ukraine. Um, so um, yeah, but at the moment we are very, very focused on on the NFT project and um, on sending our people down there to map the region. You know, there's obviously a humanitarian crisis, but how do you see the world of uh, crypto and NFTs interfacing with that at the moment? Is it merely more of a fundraising aspect, do you think? And how would that fundraising then get to the people on the ground? Well, NFTs are supposed to be linked to a governance process um, that are that um, the government process is meant to be um, supporting decentralized autonomous organizations. And if you think about what NGOs are doing today, um, being that they actually collect money from donors and then they give out money, um, decentralized autonomous organizations want to be more effective using um, crypto. Um, in order to actually um, get the money in, keep it uh, anonymous and um, make decision making um, effective for the people who are supposed to actually benefit. So without middlemen and to make sure that the governance inside of the organization is happening well. And here um, it's a pro problem at the moment because um, in, in this area of technology um, the research is not far enough and um, also it's very new for governance processes so the Ukrainian government has not implemented a um, uh, NFT strategy so far um, so I think the applicability of the technologies in the making is the core problem at the moment it's still um it's still um, used for, as you said, for fundraising. Um, but what we could, for example, do is to actually pinpoint certain regions on a map and to say money is needed here, money is needed there. And on one side, it's mostly needed for humanitarian purposes. And on the other side, it's mostly needed, for example, for education of minors. Um, and then, um, as for example, if you have 100 minors in a region, then the cash could be set free. Um, but again, like the, the um, connection between the groundwork and the actual um, usage of technology is the problem. Like when do you make sure that there's really 100 people on the ground who need this money and um, also all people need to be informed about this sort of um, workflow. Otherwise, there is, again, a high potential um, for the money to be um, used in wrong ways. So um, it's interesting to watch this um, field evolve. And if you want to participate in NFTs, uh, send us an email to techforukraine.info. Um, well, you can, you can access the, the form on techforukraine.info and send us an email through that. Okay. Um, and now, finally, I know that you've worked in this area for a long time. You were one of the, uh, you, you created something called Startup Boat. You worked in Greece during the Syrian refugee crisis, helping people on in uh, the Greek islands. Um, you did a lot of work in that, in that area. Um, 
How do you feel that um, the big, you've obviously also interacted a lot with big agencies like uh, UNHCR and UNICEF. Um, do you feel that the big uh, NGO agencies uh, like them and like others and, and others, do you feel that they've um, woken up to the potential for, for tech to help scale solutions? So um, I think that uh, it's difficult for these organizations because they have not been set up in a way that could um, do justice to the very quick um, developments that are happening in technology. So I think um, in the UN and in other organizations, unfortunately, um, things have not adapted so well. And we are also looking at cyber war that is coming um, both from the Ukrainian and the Russian side as it seems right now. Um, and the UN is right in the middle of it because there were some reports of um, Afghani people, for example, who were saying that information should not be passed on to the UN because then it would leak to the Russians. So um, there is a, there is a um, problem of trust um, towards uh, the United Nations per se. The United Nations consists of different sub-organizations and I have seen some of them innovate, others have not innovated so quickly. So this is exactly why I think that TechFugees focusing on refugees and us focusing on supporting um, people with um, the, the improvement of their lives through technology in a country um, I think these, um, these decentralized autonomous organizations are extremely important and also we don't want to um, we don't want to sort of monopolize um, victims, right? I think that the UN was very focused on um, helping helping victims, and they had um, they had a budget coming from states, whereas techfugees and other organizations are um, funded through different sources. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that the technological aspect of tech techfugees tech and other projects that are here is fantastic, and I hope they they partner with the UN. Thank you, and also uh, be great Thank to see. You. I look forward to seeing you in real life one one day eventually. Thanks very much, Paula. Uh, Bye. Uh, take care. Take care. Thank you. And uh, I think finally we've got um, uh, uh, Anna uh, from um, in Romania. Anna, thank you very much for joining us. I think it would be wonderful for you to describe what you've seen. Uh, you're working with an NGO in Romania on the border with Ukraine. You've been, you've sent me pictures uh, that some of them are quite harrowing. Just describe what's going on on the border. Give us everyone here a, a, an eyewitness account of what's happened. Yeah. Um, first of all, like um, I'm really moved. I have to congratulate absolutely everyone who has been presenting. I, I think like this is what makes it worse to wake up every single morning and have faith over future, like um, the way people react and, and the way they're actually uh, come together for better cause, it's uh, uh, very moving. So uh, yes, I uh, went to Romania on the third um, and um, we were there at uh, Shiret borders, which is uh, one of the borders uh, between Romania and Ukraine. And uh, like, well, the weather is not really, um, I mean, the winter is being very tough at this stage, even though we're approaching spring. So uh, we were like under minus six Celsius. Uh, we, we arrived there at 6 a.m. And uh, yes, I, I think it's very shocking. We do see things on TV. We do see things on Facebook and social media. But what you breathe while you're there, it's, uh, it, it, it's something, it goes beyond our imagination. There's a lot of pain everywhere. Um, what, what we do see is like since refugees come, like, uh, I mean, we've witnessed the movement in a day. It was just massive. And, and since every single like NGO there like has put at the border, like they're trying to get organized. It, it was definitely like very recent for like for everyone to be structured and organized properly. So uh, people as they were coming in, um, everyone was trying to attend them and um, there were all sorts of volunteers, but uh, police was actually doing a great work to only filter those that actually were representing ONGs and not enabling uh, random volunteers to to come closer to the borders. Um, again, that's, that's again, like the defense, uh, the human trafficking, 
Yes. Yeah. And and um and I, I think like since the border is sort of like it's small enough, like that was partially um good, like had a, an approach to be controlled, but I think like the, the the security should should go beyond the borders because uh once once they cross like uh, some of the Ukrainians they already have uh, their connections and contacts that they might have seen through social media groups. So that's what makes it like perhaps uh, mm, mm, the risk to to kind of per persist once they actually cross um, and not just at the border. So, so sorry to interrupt, but I know that you've also seen some very moving scenes of of men dropping off uh, their wives and families and then walking back into Ukraine. Is that right? Yeah, we actually uh, delivered like uh, transport in Ukraine because the the saddest thing is actually um, the ones that they cross they actually sort of show certain joy after having waited like almost days at the border on the other side. Um, like once you cross on the other side in Ukraine, the the queues are like infinite. They're like it, it's long and and it takes a lot of time for them to actually do the paperwork that. Um, um, majority like do will do an administrative part at the border so uh yes i mean families are are being broke apart i think like the most painful thing i've seen is like kids crossing alone and uh and having like pieces of paper where it indicates like what they should do next and uh, what you experience at the border after is sort of like an adrenaline of joy, but definitely like people are very lost. They don't understand what has happened to their lives. And the majority of them, they decide to sort of at a certain point stick around because they might tell you like, oh, next week we'll just be back. So um, I, I, like the confusion and the pain they're having, um, it's not really something like they can still rationalize with it. So um, um, it, um, the fact that like, I was born in North Romania, so um, the fact like those people look like you are like you and, and they're your neighbors and um, I have a lot of friends in Ukraine, it's it's very tough to actually understand what's going on and when you like rationalize it, 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 it's the most heartbreaking thing you experience has just seeing how uh, people's lives vanishes away and their future and, and their dreams. So. Um, Hi, um, I just had a quick question. Um, can you tell us who's coming over the border in terms of their ages, uh, the, the gender, and you know, are elderly people coming across alone? Um, is it predominantly women and children? Like, what's the demographic of the people coming over? Thank you. Yeah, uh, what we've seen is uh, like, the ones that come at the border are women and kids, majority. And uh, and what we've seen, I mean, at the beginning, like from the third until the uh, ninth, like basically the people that were crossing were sort of uh, medium class and, and some like looked also quite wealthy in that sense. And uh, um, that's one of the concerns like we sort of had at the beginning is that right now, like, those that sort of like can afford like there's been a lot of uh, um discussions around the border is actually the ukrainian police at the border like needing to be bribed in order to allow people to cross so um like we've seen like women maybe between um 18 up to like 40 and then kids um majority in between 12 and 16 um, also little ones and babies, but um, elders, uh, we haven't seen that much, uh, unless like they really come from close, closer to the cities. Um, they decide rather to stay because there, there's not much for them or like much. Um, so uh, I, I've been in contact with friends of mine that are in Ukraine asking if we should support, like um, give some support for their parents to leave. And majority is like, they, they, don't, they don't feel like they have the energy or capacity to do so and travel and, and refugee across world. What do you think that um, people outside, uh, you know, the border countries in Ukraine, uh, what message would you have to those of us either here in the UK or on Zoom um, would be the, the kinds of things, the, the 
great themes or the great issues you think we should concentrate on. It doesn't have to be something to do with technology, it could be something else. What, what do you feel as a result of the yeah. experience? I think uh, a lot of um, efforts have been placed in Poland and it's been absolutely great to see how that came so fast together. Um, truth is that actually all borders should be equally um, ha like filled with the same capacity to support at the same level the refugees, just like this flow will allow them to uh, securely like cross borders. Um, and uh, what I'm concerned is like how much Right. How many refugees would we as, as Europe be able to absorb as the numbers they say might grow? Um, but uh, Republic Moldova also is like at a, at a great need. Um, from my perspective, like um, there hasn't been much uh, press around those borders, but they have been in the same needs that, than the others. And what we've seen is like the number of refugees sort of increased and remained because in Romania more than we expected it because um, it's not a matter of them choosing anymore to go to Poland. Uh, many like cross Poland right now, like cross Romania borders and afterwards they ask uh, right away, like how can they get to Poland to like reunite with their families? So um, it's just like the country's infrastructure, it's not enabling them to choose to which borders to cross and most likely uh, more and more refugees are going to come through this border that, um, from Romania and Hungary and uh, Republic Moldova. So um, I guess we, we should show like a great capacity to distribute the supplies. Uh, and and um, I mean, I can say certainly that like uh, vouching for certain foundations that have been on the ground, it's great to see their work, but uh, we do need more international support on, on those areas. Uh, aside from that, like um, I, I must say, like I'm really, impressed of how how much like um, we've achieved even in the group of tech refugees um, like the resources and everything like I've moved fast and if we've been able to to um, absorb these refugees so far as uh, it does say a lot about who we are um, as Europe right now and as people so well um, I totally concur with you that yeah absolutely it's been a great experience that to see that the community of tech refugees come together and help each other across many of our WhatsApp groups and across Slack. And uh, there's been some real fantastic uh, on the ground supports, not just in, in terms of tech, but in real, real help, you know, driving people, getting supplies, things like that. Fantastic. And we're uh, really grateful for you to uh, come and join, join us today, Anna. And uh, I'll see you and soon at some point in Barcelona. But for now, thank you very yeah. much for tuning in. Thank and you, everyone. Thank you. And I'll let you go now. Now, unfortunately, I'm going to have to say apologies to everyone on Slack, uh, on Zoom and here. We've, we've kind of run out of time with our venue um, because we had so much to get through. What we're going to do is we'll be going doing a country group check-in next week on, uh, on Zoom. And I think we'll probably do that as a full virtual event because uh, it was quite tough to get venues and organised. So we'll do that, and for those of you who would like to join, we'll, we'll do that uh, probably in the evening this week at some point. Um, and the idea being to get countries to, our tech produce countries to come in and do a bit of a check-in, see what's going on, uh, get some more information, more data about what's going on there. So I want to say thank you very much for everyone on Zoom over there. Wave to them on the camera, if you can see them. Oh, goodbye, everybody. Thank you very much from London. And uh, we're, oh, we're switching, switching camera lanes. Mm -hmm. um, and um, thank you very much for coming, both on Zoom and in real life. Uh, from me, Mike Butcher at Tech Fugees, thanks very much for joining everybody. And we'll see you again online and we'll be circulating details at the next event. And uh, thank you very much for persevering with us, with us through our some of our technical issues.